السلام عليكم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We want to welcome everyone to the Philadelphia Masjid to witness the In the Path of the Lecture series, which is part of a larger project of the Free Library of Philadelphia. And this project was made possible by the Doris Duke Foundation Path for Islamic Art. For more information about the Path of Islam lecture series, this project and any upcoming events, you can look online at the freelibrary.org forward slash Path of Islam. Or you can email mmw at freelibrary.org. Our speaker today is Dr. Tahir Wyatt. Dr. Tahir Wyatt is a published academic researcher and an instructor of Islamic studies and comparative religion. During Dr. Wyatt's 21 years of studying and teaching in the Middle East, he produced several degrees. He procured several degrees, including a doctorate in theology. He was also the only American ever to be appointed to teach in the Prophet's Mosque in Medina, the second holiest site in the Muslim world. Dr. Wyatt currently serves as a researcher and director of a prominent think tank and lectures both nationally and internationally at mosques, universities, and other educational institutions. He is also the executive director of the United Muslim Masjid, program manager of the Philadelphia Masjid, and sits on the board of several nonprofits dedicated to community development and social services. The topic of today's lecture is titled Virtues of Ramadan. Ramadan, the ninth month in which the Quran was revealed, is considered the most blessed month of the year for Muslims. From pre-dawn to sunset for an entire month, Muslims abstain from food and drink as a means of gaining greater God consciousness, known in Arabic as taqwa, signifying a state of constant awareness of Allah. Ramadan is meant to be a time of spiritual discipline and deep contemplation of one's relationship with the creator. These objectives are actualized through extra prayer, an intense study of the Quran, and increased charity and generosity. Every single day of Ramadan gives Muslims the opportunity to reap spiritual bounties and divine reward unique to his holy month. Unique to this holy month. In the coming lecture, Dr. Wyatt will discuss the importance of Ramadan, its special virtues, and how Muslims all over the world look forward to Ramadan as an opportunity to grow in moral excellence. Dr. Wyatt. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liyus salihin. Ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu ba'athuhu allahu rahmatan lil alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa an'im ala nabiyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shall I say that again? Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Much better that time, mashallah. Uh, uh, first and foremost, it is important that we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this easy for us to gather in the masjid, one of the houses of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that there is no group of people who gather in the house of Allah reciting his book, studying it amongst themselves, except that they are surrounded by the angels and that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
penetrates that gathering. Uh, that Allah mentions those people in the company of the highest level of angels. So it's a great blessing to be in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're going to study some of the verses of the Quran today. But ultimately, the objective of today's lesson is to deal with the title uh, that was given, which is the virtues of Ramadan. We're going to discuss the virtues of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, which is a very appropriate topic. Does anybody know what today's date is? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have one vote for the 10th of Shaban. Everybody agree with that? It is. It is the 10th of Sha'ban today. And Sha'ban is the eighth month on the Islamic calendar. So we have approximately 20 days left, give or take a day. We have 20 days approximately until the month of Ramadan begins. Because the month of Ramadan is the ninth month on the Islamic calendar. So it's important that we prepare for the month of Ramadan. The more we know how important the month of Ramadan is and the virtues of Ramadan, the better we'll prepare. When you know that something important is coming up, you prepare for it. When you're excited about something that's coming up, you prepare for that thing. And so we're excited about Ramadan because of its importance and because of the virtue of the month of Ramadan. And so it's important that we begin now that preparation for the month of Ramadan. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that Islam is built on five. Bunial Islamu ala khams. Islam is built on five. Those five things are all what we call pillars of Islam. That means that these are the foundations upon which Islam is built. So what I'm going to do is I'll start over here and I want to know what's one of the pillars of Islam. Somebody on this side. It's a pillar. Yes. Um, say it again. Salah. Okay. So the prayer, the five daily prayers, that's one of the pillars of Islam. Yes. Zakat, which is the obligatory almsgiving that we have to do on the surplus of our wealth annually. Okay. Back there. Yes. Soam. What's soam? What is that? Fasting. All fasting? Okay. So fasting during the month of Ramadan is a pillar of Islam. Yes. Hajj. Right. So making the pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in a lifetime. And we're forgetting the most important pillar of Islam, the first one. Yes. So the testimony of faith, right, which is ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. I testify that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah, that there is no true deity except Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a slave and messenger. So those are the five, what we call the five pillars of Islam. Notice that the young man, he mentioned that fasting, fasting the month of Ramadan, is one of those pillars. Each pillar of Islam is very, very important for every Muslim. I wanna start, we just go down very quickly, go down this list so that we can understand where Ramadan fits into the, to the scope of Islam as a whole. We start off with the testimony of faith. That's how somebody becomes a Muslim. They profess the conviction that they have in their heart that they were created and that they were created for a purpose. And they recognize that their creator is Allah and that he is the only true deity, is the one who created the heavens and the earth. And therefore, we will not worship anyone else except Allah. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu told us, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al that every single child that is born on earth is born on the fitrah. 
That is that they have a natural disposition to the recognition of their creator and the desire to worship him alone. Pay attention. Two things. We talk about children being born on the fitrah. Everyone that is born has the fitrah, natural inclination to do what? To recognize and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say, فَأَبَوَاهُ يُحَوِّدَانِهِ وَيُنَصِّرَانِهِ وَيُمَجِّسَانِهِ but through their parents, they may change and be nurtured upon Judaism, Christianity, or otherwise. Meaning what? They're still worshiping something. Everybody, every human being is going to worship something. You cannot take that out of the human being more than you could take out the ability to breathe and still live. Every human being is going to worship something. It is Islam when we worship Allah and submit to him alone. You cannot get rid of the first part, which is the desire to worship something, to recognize a higher power. Even those who deny belief in any God, they say they don't believe in God. Many of them, if you start going down the path with them, they'll recognize that there is some greater force though they may not call that God. So they recognize that there is a higher power than them. But the corruption comes into the second part, which is worshiping Allah alone. And so many people move away from them. When we testify that there's none worthy of worship except for Allah, we're testifying to our fitrah, to our natural inclination to worship Allah alone, and then we testify that he sent messengers. The last of them was Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is a conviction that we have inside of us that we profess. And it requires that we do certain things based on that testimony. We move down to salah and our obligation to pray five times a day. That obligation to pray five times a day requires sacrifice from us. We're sacrificing our time. We're sacrificing some of our exerting ourselves physically. And so it takes work to pray five times a day. But if we do so, then that prayer will be a light for us as the Prophet Sallallahu says, was salat nur. Prayer is light. It provides you light in this life and it provides you light in the next life. And it is a purifying factor. And it is that connection between you and Allah, that daily connection that you need. You have to, again, your salat reminds you of your hereafter. It reminds you of the standing that you will do in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next life. So you stand in front of him in this life. And you stop doing the work that you're doing during the day. Many of us, we get busy during the day, right? Start your day, you're busy, and, and, and there's a grind, and there's a hustle. You stop that because you recognize that there's something more important than what I'm doing here. There's something more important than just making money. There's something more important than even serving people and that's serving the creator of people. And so we stop our salat. We sacrifice that time and that bodily effort. Move on to zakat. We love money. All of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that when it comes to mankind, his love of wealth is, is strong, it's severe. We love money. How do we purify that money that we have and make sure that if we have surplus wealth, that we are also looking out for the rest of the people in the community that's through zakat. So zakat is the ibadah of giving away what you love. That's very important. That we sacrifice something that we love for the sake of Allah. Move on to fast. And this is what the talk is about, if you will. Fast. What do you do when you fast? What are you giving away when you fast? Yeah. 
you're giving away food and water? <laughs> that was good. Look, that's a good start. Bismillah. Yes. You're giving away what now? No, no, no. When you fast, you're not giving away money. Go ahead. You're giving away food. This is, I'm glad that you all said that. When you fast, you're not doing anything. I, I want you to notice this. Fasting is a very different type of worship than everything else that we do. Because the worship of fasting is to not do anything. It's actually, if you look at zakat as being giving away what you love, right? Then fasting is actually refraining from what you love. It's staying away from what you love. That's what you do when you fast. So you don't eat and you don't drink, right? You don't do those things that sustain your life or, or the life or human life, if you will, because you're going to refrain from marital relations as well. You stay away from those things that are life-sustaining, the appetites that you naturally crave for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that trains the soul a different way. So you give away what you love with zakat. That's teaching you not to be stingy. You refrain from eating and drinking and those other things you naturally like. That's teaching you sabr. It's teaching you patience. We move on to hajj. And hajj is a huge sacrifice of both body and wealth and time and comfort and everything else so that you can go and get that lifetime reward of a total cleanse by making that pilgrimage to Mecca. All of that to say that fasting cannot be replaced by any other act of worship. It's a very, very important act of worship that helps us in so many ways on a spiritual level, and it helps on a communal level as well, as we'll see bi-idnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. The question then comes, why the month of Ramadan? And why is the month of Ramadan so special to Muslims? And what is this? Why, why do we look at this month as being so special? And the, the answer to that question is, why, well, maybe I'll answer it with a different question. Why is a $100 bill worth more than a $20 bill? I, I, so I know this is like really philosophical, but I need, I need you to stay with me. I need, I need you to think about this, this question. Why is a $100 bill? For, so I, I'll give you a hint. Is there any like, Thing different about the paper. Does the paper that the $20 bill is uh, printed on, is that better than the paper of the $100 bill? Huh? I'm asking you, why does the $100 bill have more value? Is it just because we wrote a one and a zero on it? Yeah, go ahead. Because 20 is less than 100. <laughs> It is, but that, okay, I, but I, I'll give you an example. If I took a, a, a hundred, uh, hundred rupees on, on a piece of paper, it says a hundred on it, and I got $20, I, I'll give you the answer. The answer is because that's what we gave it. That's the value that we recognize that it has as, as a society. Otherwise, it's just paper. It's not even backed by gold or anything else. It's backed by confidence that we say uh, that that's what it's worth. And so that's what it's worth to us as a society. Ramadan does not get its value because we said it's special. Ramadan has its value because the creator of time and the creator of space said that that time is blessed. The one who created us in different shapes and colors and different places on the planet and so forth, he also created the months. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he assigned to those months different values. 
And Ramadan has value because Allah revealed to us that it has value. And so we believe that this month is the most blessed month of the year. And it's more important than the month that comes after it and the month that comes before it, because Allah said so. And so when someone asks you, why do you fast in the month of Ramadan? Our answer to that question, first and foremost, is because we're Muslim and we submit to Allah and we do what Allah tells us to do. I need that to sink in because many times we get wrapped up. It's not such a bad thing. We start talking about the wisdom of fasting, Ramadan. And so we talk about being able to empathize with those who are less fortunate than us who do not get to eat whenever they want to eat like a lot of us can. And so, yeah, that does happen in Ramadan. You start to empathize with people who are dealing with food insecurity throughout the year. But that's not why we fast the month of Ramadan. And that's not why Ramadan has value. Until we recognize who we are, there's no way that we can walk on a straight path. In fact, even life has less value when you don't realize that you are a slave of Allah. I do these things because my master told me to, and I'm happy for it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants nothing in return from me. I worship Allah as we're done. I'm happy in this life. I'm successful in the next life. Alhamdulillah. And that's why I fast the month of Ramadan. First and foremost. Now, Allah has talked about some of the wisdom for fasting the month of Ramadan. We'll go through some of that as time allows. I want to go over some of the statements of the Prophet وسلم, about the month of Ramadan. Kind of analyze these statements, many of which you may have heard before, but may not have contemplated what this really means for us and how we should be approaching this month of Ramadan. So let's look at the virtues of this beautiful month of Ramadan. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companions, atakum Ramadan shahrun mubarak. Ramadan has come to you, a blessed month. Shahrun mubarak, it is a blessed month. Faradallahu azza wa jal alaykum siyamahu. Allah has made it an obligation for you all to fast the month. And when we say fast the month, we're talking about fasting during the daytime from dawn, from fajr, okay? Not from sun up. That's a big misconception that you'll find in some books. It says we fast from sun up to sundown. No, we fast from fajr, the advantage of fajr time until sundown. So that's, be that's before sun up. We fast during that time period from everything, including water, which is another misconception. We don't put any, we don't ingest anything. So we don't chew gum. We don't, uh, you, you know, have breath mints or anything like that. You don't drink water. You stay away from everything from, from Fajr time until sunset. Faradallahu alaykum siyamahu. Allah has made it an obligation that you fast. The Prophet وسلم, said that the gates of heaven are open during this month and the doors to Jahannam, to the hellfire, are closed. The evil shayateen, the most evil of the shayateen, are chained up, they're locked up. We'll talk about that in a minute, inshallah. Look, just, just look so far, what, what do we have? The Prophet said what? It is a blessed month, okay? The doors of heaven are open. The doors of the hellfire are closed. The shayateen, the devils are chained, locked up. Fihi laylatun khayrun min alfi shahar. In that month, there is a night that is greater than, better than a thousand months. Meaning, 
that the worship that is performed in that night alone is better than the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a thousand months, which is over 83 years. Man hurima khayraha faqad hurim. Whoever is deprived of the goodness of this month is truly deprived. That person is truly deprived. If we start to look at the benefits of the month of Ramadan, then there is absolutely no other month on our calendar that resembles the blessing that we get from this month. I, I wanted to take a stop for a second in, in, in this part of the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, in another hadith, it's the same meaning. He says, This hadith is Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, when Ramadan comes, the doors of Jannah are open. How many doors in Jannah? Eight. There are eight gates for Jannah. All of them are open during the month of Ramadan. All of the doors to hell are closed. And the devils are chained up. This, and, I, and I, I look at this as one of the major virtues of Ramadan, is that the devils are chained. Does evil still happen in Ramadan? Yes. What agents of evil are there? Hmm. Yes, correct. Yourself, your own nafs, and the shayateen, and the devils. So the evil that a person may do, the sins that one may commit in Ramadan, is not something that a person should do uh, believing that Oh, or blaming the shaitan for that. Why, why is this such a, a major, in my mind, a major virtue of Ramadan? It's because part of our journey in life is knowing who we are. You get to learn your own faults when shaitan is out the way. Meaning that now I get to see that this is something I need to work on. This is me. This is who I am. And I need to change this about myself so that I can be a better person. So that we can remove these obstacles that are in between myself and nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to be near Allah. If we, if we look, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but if we look, Allah in the context of talking about Ramadan, Allah tells the Prophet, If my servants ask you about me, I am Qareeb, I'm close, I'm near. What is it that prevents us from that nearness to our Creator? It's the, it's the obstacles that we put in the way, it's the sins that we commit. And so in Ramadan, what, what happens now is we stop pointing the finger. And that's important because everyone who wants to be better at anything, I know a lot of you young guys here today, inshallah, after uh, at Dhuhr time or after Dhuhr, you're going to play basketball, right? When you lose a game, do you look at what you did wrong? Or do you immediately say, my teammate did this, my coach sucks, this one, eh? right? A lot of people look externally. They want to point the finger. They want to blame everybody else for why they weren't able to do good at whatever it might be. But Ramadan is about accountability. It's about accountability. And now... The devils are chained. This is one of the greatest virtues of Ramadan because you get to learn who you are, Ya Abdullah. 
then that is a great lesson from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows you to see yourself so that you can fix yourself with his aid. In another hadith, in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after mentioning that the doors of Jannah are open and the doors of the hellfire are closed, he then says, وَيُنَادِي مُنَادِينَ A caller calls out. And as the scholars of hadith, many of the scholars of hadith say, this is an angel that calls out. يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلِ Oh, you who is looking for good. This is, this is what happens at the very beginning of Ramadan. Ya baghi al khair aqbil. You who wants good, come forward. You'll find all of the good you're looking for. Wa ya baghi al sharri aqsir. You who wants evil, refrain, stop, pause. Stop right there. And this happens, subhanAllah. If you think about it, because the shayateen are locked up, you now are, if anything, you're hearing more angelic whispers. Huh? As you're going to do something that maybe you shouldn't do in Ramadan, you're going to have more of that internal speech, if you will, telling you, no, nah, I nah, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, baghi ashar aqsir. Stop and refrain. And Allah Azza wa Jal has people that he frees from the fire. And that is every single night in the month of Ramadan. Ya Abdullah, I, I want you to think about that statement, that there are people who are freed from the fire. What does it mean to be freed from the fire, it means that the shackles are removed, that anything that would tie you to the fire from evil deeds, that all of those are removed. And Allah has declared that you are free from the fire. That means that you are a person of Jannah. Mind you, we don't know. There's no way for us to know that that has happened. But we know that it does happen because the Prophet Sallallahu said that it happens. Meaning, we don't know individually, are we from those people whom Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has freed from the fire or not? But that happens every single night in the month of Ramadan. And Allah Azza wa Jal, when he talks about the discourse between the believers and those who pretended to be believers in this life, the hypocrites, when he talks about the discourse that they have in the hereafter, one of the things that the believers will say to the hypocrites is when the hypocrites ask them for light. To that part, where they ask, where the believers say to the hypocrites, Your abode will be the hellfire, and the hellfire is now your master. You don't want to be a slave of the hellfire. You want to be freed from that. And we only want to be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the point is that every night in Ramadan, this is another virtue from the virtues of Ramadan, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees people from the hellfire. I'm trying to be conscious of the time. I, I will say a few things ta'ala, that I think are very important for us to look at uh, when it comes to the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is often called the month of fasting. It's often called the month of the Quran. And both of them are true. When we look at fasting, the reward for fasting is one of the virtues of Ramadan, is that the reward for fasting is multiplied in a way that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can assign a number to. 
The Prophet Sallallahu says that Allah says, Kullu amad ibn Adam alahu. Every action that the son of Adam does is for him. Al hasanatu bi ashri amthaliha ila sab'i miyati dhi'fin. Every good deed that one does is multiplied 10 to 700 times. Then Allah says, إِلَّا الصَّوْمُ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِبِهِ Except for fasting, because fasting is for me and I will reward for it. Now, what does it mean that fasting is for Allah? Meaning Allah is saying that when a person fasts, that it is only him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that truly knows that that person is fasting. If you pray, somebody else can see you pray, you give zakat, the people you give it to, they know you gave them zakat. You make hajj with a million, two million other people, three million other people. But fasting, even if you're sitting next to somebody, how do they know you're fasting? Even if it's Ramadan, how do they know that you're fasting? Because what did we talk about from the very beginning? Fasting is not that you're actually Doing something is that you're what? Refraining from doing something. And nobody can see that. They can see what you do out in public, but they don't know. You can go into a closed room and you can eat and drink and you can still come out and pretend that you're fasting. Nobody's going to know. So fasting is for Allah. And Allah is with alone. In the huli. And I will reward for that. Meaning beyond the 700 times that a normal action may be rewarded. And this is powerful. This is powerful that a person does this day in and day out throughout the month of Ramadan and receive that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about the Quran, then yes, Ramadan is also the month of the Quran. And this is a great virtue of the month of Ramadan. In fact, our fasting is a means of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for revealing the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Hudal linnas wa bayyinatin min al-huda wal-furqan. Allah says, the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed. Guidance to mankind. SubhanAllah, stop there. We're done. Guidance for mankind. Ya khi, SubhanAllah. Can we just take a minute to appreciate the fact that we have communication from the creator of the heavens and the earth to mankind, unadulterated, uncorrupted, in its form that it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No other prophet claims, or no other religion in fact, claims that they have what we have in the Quran. Did you know that? Like, the Christians with the New Testament, do they believe that Allah revealed the letters that Paul wrote, just like, like the way that we reveal, like we believe the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, they believe that Paul was inspired, right, by the Holy Ghost to write what he wrote, but not that it is the verbatim word of God. And then the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, do they believe that they were revealed like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received revelation and that they have the original language in which, is, in which it was revealed? And uh, they, don't, they don't believe that about their holy book, though they believe that it is the word of God in a different kind of way. The Jewish scripture, which is also called the Bible, by the way, or what the Christians would refer to as the Old Testament, the Torah and the books that come after, they don't believe that they were revealed the way that the Quran was revealed and that they have it with an unconnected chain back to Musa alayhi They don't believe that. They don't even believe that about their book. And so, when we look at mankind and we say, well, 
What is this life all about? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Where do we find those answers? Are we supposed to go to Aristotle, Plato? Are we supposed to go to big philosophers that are trying to figure it out themselves? That they change. If you look at their own writings from decade to decade, that they themselves have perhaps answered those questions differently. Is that where we're supposed to find the answers? Or do we in fact need communication from the creator of the heavens and earth and the one who created us? The fact that we have that with us is truly a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that needs to be appreciated by us. And that reconnection with the Quran that happens in the month of Ramadan is spectacular. And it's one of the great virtues of the month of Ramadan, the fact that we would stand in prayer behind someone who in general, and many of the Masajid is going to recite the Quran from cover to cover in the month of Ramadan. And the Prophet Sallallahu informed us that as-siyam wal-Qur'an yushafi'ani, yani that the Quran and, the, and your fasting will come and actually uh, uh, intercede on your behalf on the day of judgment. Your fasting will come, subhanAllah, think about this. Your fasting will have a form, fasting, which is intangible right now. It's an abstract concept. It will have a form on the day of judgment and it will talk on your behalf to say, I prevented him from his food and his drink and his lust and his desires. I prevented him from all of that. So forgive him. One of the virtues of Ramadan is that it expiates sins. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Wa Ramadan ila Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu said, As salawatu al khams wal jum'atu ila al jum'a. Wa Ramadan ila Ramadan. That your five daily prayers and from one Jum'ah to the next Jum'ah and from a Ramadan to a Ramadan expiates the sins that were committed in between as long as one avoids major sins. And the Prophet said, Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan with true Iman, true faith, and seeking Allah's reward will have all of his previous sins forgiven. This is from the great virtues of this month of Ramadan. The virtues of this month, subhanAllah, I mean, if, if we had a few hours, we could probably make it through the majority of the ahadith on the subject, but we don't. But I just want us to understand that this is a month where we celebrate the Quran, where we show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the guidance of the Quran that has also come as a furqan. It distinguishes between truth and falsehood. That it is a time of deep, deep spiritual reflection. That the objective of our fasting is not to leave off food and drink so that we're hungry. The Prophet said, Perhaps there's someone who fasts, who gets nothing out of his fast. His portion of the fast is that he's hungry and he's thirsty. That's not the objective of this fast. This fast should be changing us from the inside and changing our character. The Prophet said, Whoever does not leave off false speech, lying, saying evil things, and acting according to that false speech. And acting, the Prophet said, which means to act foolishly, you know, to, 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 to insult people and so forth. Whoever doesn't leave that off, Allah has no need for him to leave off his food and his drink. The question comes here, is that Allah is al-ghani. He is the one who is rich, independent, in need of nothing. Does he need you to leave off your food and your drink? No. So therefore, the purpose there, what we understand from this hadith of the Prophet is that the purpose of you leaving off your food and your drink is not to just leave off food and drink so that you're hungry. It's so that you get that self-discipline that comes with the restraint 
with refraining from food and drink. Because here, and this is the last point I'll make about this, inshallah, is that in order to develop a hunger for the Quran, in order to develop a hunger for having a relationship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to curb your other appetites. And that's what Ramadan does for you. After your first day, second day, third day of fasting, guess what happens during the day? You're no longer just thinking about food and drink all of the time and filling up your, you know, these natural appetites that you have. That appetite has been curbed. And now you become hungry. Your spirit becomes hungry. You want to nourish your soul. And sometimes you have to starve your body to nourish your soul. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam. Kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattakoon. Oh, you have believed, oh, you believe. Fasting has been prescribed for you like it has been prescribed for the nations that came before you so that you can attain taqwa. Taqwa is that nourishment of the soul. It is that self-discipline. It is the ability to refrain from those things that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is taqwa. And if you attain that, then you have attained the objective of the fast itself. Uh, a lot more could be said on the topic of the virtues of Ramadan, but I'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala, to open up the floor for questions and answers, because perhaps the questions that you have, inshallah, may bring out uh, some very important points. Now, hold up, hold up, brother. Wait for them to come with the mic if they have to record it earlier. Uh, one question, Dr. Tahir. What if a person is afflicted? That's just that's the way the question is? Yeah. Uh, so apparently, okay. So, so the questioner, the question says, what if a person is afflicted? What we're understanding from that, meaning that they have some type of difficulty that prevents them from being able to fast uh, during the month of Ramadan. The, the person's ability or inability to fast does not change the blessing of the month of Ramadan itself. So all of those things are still a reality. The doors of Jannah are open. The shayateen are locked up. The doors of the, uh, of the hellfire are closed. It is still a blessed month. It's still the month of the Quran. However, this particular person who does not have the ability to fast if in fact they don't have the ability to fast due to a medical reason, for example, then they are excused from the fast. They don't have to fast in the month of Ramadan. If it is a permanent situation, meaning that they have a permanent illness that prevents them from fasting, then what they do is they feed a poor person for every day that is missed during the month of Ramadan. And the month of Ramadan is always either 29 days or 30 days. So they're going to feed 29 poor people for the, or, or 30 for the entire month of Ramadan to expiate for the fact that they did not have the ability to fast. And that is their ability. And that is within their ability to, to feed the Ibn That being said, the person who cannot fast for a medical reason or otherwise, it should not stop them from increasing in the reading of the Quran uh, attending the masjid and praying tarawih, uh, which is the, the prayer that is after Salat al-Isha, uh, that is specific to Ramadan. And the other, you know, being involved in the other acts of ibadah that are, that are recommended in the month of Ramadan. And from those acts is in fact feeding a fasting person. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ فَطَّرَ صَائِمًا فَلَهُ مِثْلُ أَجْرِهِ Whoever is able to feed a fasting person, right? once they break their fast, then, that per then the feeder will have the reward of the one who was fasting without any reward being diminished from the fasting person's reward. So yani a person who does not have the ability to fast in the month of Ramadan should still take advantage of the month of Ramadan and all that it offers. 
brother, brother in the back has a question. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Can you hear me? Um, That's for recording. And um, in regards to the, the gate of Rayyan, is that only for the people who fast Nawafil or is this also for Ramadan? So when we talk about the, the gates of Jannah, there are eight gates. And one of the gates is Arrayan. Okay? And interestingly enough, the Prophet Salaam, said those who were uh, engaged in prayer will be called from the you know, Bab, Bab of Salah. They will be called from the door of prayer. But the fasting people will be called from the door of Arrayan. That gate, which, which Arrayan means to quench the thirst, right? So it's, the, it's actually the opposite of, of Siam. The, the question is, well, is, does that door only open for the people who are involved uh, in uh, supererogatory, voluntary fast? And the answer is that the majority of the scholars of Islam, rahimahumullah, they say that all of those doors, when we talk about the specific doors being opened, it's for people who do what is beyond the minimum. So fasting the month of Ramadan is a minimum requirement for a Muslim. Fasting, five, praying five times a day is the minimal requirement for a Muslim. Going beyond that, and doing the extra acts of worship in a particular field is what they say will you know cause that door to be open for a person be ibn Allah ta'ala and uh, ibn abdul bar rahimahullah and others from amongst the scholars the early scholars of islam have mentioned that for most people only one door is going to open for most people only one door is going to open because allah azza wa has distributed the desire and ability to do certain acts the same way that he has distributed wealth. The same way that he has distributed wealth. So some people, subhanAllah, for them, the door of salah is open. MashaAllah, they, they, they do a lot of extra prayers, but not a lot of extra fasting. For other people, they do a lot of extra fasting, but not a lot of extra prayer. For other people, they do a lot of extra sadaqah and charity, but maybe not, you know, a lot of extra prayers and so forth. So, Find that door that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened for you and strive. Strive to be from amongst the people who get called from that door. Dr. White, if a person is a truck driver and on the road every day, is he or she still obligated to fast or is this considered traveling? If it is traveling, what is the obligation so the, uh, the question is, if a, person is on, if a person is a truck driver and they're on the road every day in the month of Ramadan, uh, is that person considered to be a traveler and do they still have to fast? The answer to that question is that travelers uh, do not have to fast during the month of Ramadan. Yeah, meaning what? If a person is traveling for a week in Ramadan or a person travels every single day, like a truck driver or a pilot, for example, who is always traveling, then that person does not have to fast during the month of Ramadan. However, my recommendation to that particular person or people that are in that same category is, is that even though they don't have to fast in Ramadan, they have to make up the fast that they missed before the next Ramadan. So if you're a truck driver and you drive seven days a week and that's what you're doing, you plan on doing that for the next year, it's probably going to be easier for you to fast in the month of Ramadan when all the rest of the Muslims are fasting, right? It's probably gonna be easier for you to do it them then, and it is also what they call meaning what? That it's quicker in removing the liability. Nobody likes to have a debt. Right? Nobody likes to owe somebody something. So if you owe a large oh, days of fasting, it's better to it's better to not owe and just to, to do that fast in the month of Ramadan. However, some traveling is more difficult than other traveling. So traveling from here to 
New York City, for example, and that's where you're going to be or whatever, that, that may be a lot easier and easier for you to fast than let's just say you're traveling cross country uh, in, in that truck. So a person has to know their situation just because you don't have to fast while you're traveling does not mean that you're off the hook. You still have to make up the days uh, fast. And Allah knows best. Um, as far as the person that's sick can't fast, does it have to? Does it has to be a, a a poor person that he feeds, or can he just feed anybody? Uh, I'm sorry. Just repeat the question real quick. The uh, person that can't that's not able to fast because of illness. Does, it has, does he have to feed a poor person or can he feed anybody? Great question. Uh, the, the question is, if a person does not have the ability to fast during the month of Ramadan, and they're not able to make up their fast, meaning that this person has a perpetual illness that prevents them from fasting. So their obligation is to do what? They have to feed instead of fasting. The, the question here is, do they have to just, can they just feed anybody? or do they have to feed a poor person? And the answer is that it has to be a poor person. The ta'am, uh, the, the, the ta'am has to be for the masakin, for the needy people, okay? And a miskin, just for purposes of definition, is somebody who does not have what they need to meet their needs. What does that mean? A person can have a job and still be miskin. A person can have a good job huh, and still be needy. Why? Because the expenses of their household, okay, are greater than the income for their household. So if they've got children in college and they've got a car that they're paying and so forth, and they've got rent and whatever else might be going on, and, and, and their expenses are $90,000, right? And they have a job that gives them an income of $88,000. Then from an Islamic standpoint, that person is considered to be needy, even though they make $88,000 a year. Clear? So that is a person who could accept, right, your feeding of them. Assalamualaikum. If you die during Ramadan, do you automatically go to Jannah? MashaAllah. Great question. So the, the question is, if you die during the month of Ramadan, do you automatically go to Jannah? And it's interesting that he would ask this question because this has actually been discussed in the literature based on the hadith that we talked about earlier in several hadith where the Prophet ﷺ talked about the doors of Jannah being open and the doors of the hellfire being closed. Okay, during the month of Ramadan. And the answer is Allah knows best. Allah knows best. We don't have anything definitive to say yes or no. But what it appears is that dying in Ramadan is a good sign in that sense, but that a person is still held accountable for their deeds, except for those whom have explicitly been mentioned are not held accountable, uh, meaning that they are able to go to Jannah without accountability. And there's, I mean, that would be a totally different discussion. Long time. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, if, if you sin in Ramadan before you die, would you still go to Jannah? If you sin before dying in Ramadan, would you still go to Jannah? question is, if you sin in Ramadan before dying, will you still go to Jannah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna allaha la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dharika liman yasha. Allah does not forgive that partners be associated with him. He does not forgive shirk. But he forgives other than that, that which he wills. He forgives other than that, whatever he wills. So a person who dies without having repented to Allah for the sins that they have committed, then that person is under the will of Allah. And Allah's mercy is much greater than his anger. And so we hope that a person who has died 
in that state would be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we don't know. And every person who dies without associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will eventually be from amongst the people of paradise. The, the question that the brother asked about the feeding the poor person, does it have to be a Muslim or non-Muslim? No, so the, the scholars, uh, when they talk about the feeding for expiating, that has to be poor Muslims. Feeding for expiating. Those purposes are, have to be uh, poor Muslims. As for feeding in general, meaning outside of expiation, then that's across the board. I, I want to make this point clear. Okay. So here we're talking about an act of worship. You know, this person was supposed to do what? Supposed to fast. They didn't have the ability to fast, so we move to the next level, which is that they what? That they feed. Okay. In this scenario, it's considered to be an expiation for not fasting. That has to be a poor Muslim. Clear? Outside of that, when we talk about just the virtue of in the in the, the the value of feeding people as a whole, then that extends to all of mankind. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, when he first came to Medina, when he first arrived in Medina, Abdullah bin Salam, who was Jewish at the time, did not accepted Islam, radiallahu anhu. He said, I was amongst the people who initially was with that crowd who gathered around the Prophet وسلم, when he first arrived in Medina. I wanted to hear what he had to say. He wasn't a Muslim yet. He said, the first thing I heard the Prophet وسلم, say was, O oh, people, Fshu salam, spread the salam. Huh? And feed the people. Feed the people. And there were all types of people around, right? It wasn't just, it wasn't a Muslim environment just yet. And pray at night when the people are sleeping, you will enter paradise peacefully. We, we want to know if the sisters have any questions. Yes, no. I can't see, honestly. So, should I move closer? Assalamu alaikum. Um, so there are a lot of young people here today. I have a question um, about, is there any like specific uh, advice that you might give or any words of encouragement for people who may be new to fasting, like any young people who maybe this is their first year of fasting and their parents? Okay, excellent, alhamdulillah. So uh, advice to um, the young people who this may be their first year of fasting, or some of the parents uh, of, the, of the young people. Let, let me say this. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I love the fact that there are so many young people here, so many young Muslims here. That's a, that is truly a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope that you always feel welcomed in the house of Allah, that you always feel like you have a place here, and that you always feel like you can talk to us about whatever it is that you might be going through in life. Because the reality is, is that you all are the leaders for the next generation of mankind. You are. You're blessed to know la ilaha illallah, that there is no true God and no one worthy of your total devotion, except for Allah. And therefore you have a role to play in society. As this month approaches, this month of Ramadan, approach it with an open heart, asking Allah for his guidance and his help. And then come experience the beauty of this month. Like, you know, SubhanAllah, especially if this is your first time fasting, uh, it, you may find a little difficulty. I doubt you'll find a lot, inshallah. 
you may find a little difficulty throughout the day. If you go to school and everybody around you is eating and you're not, that may be a little bit difficult when you first go through it. But just remember, just remember that your ability to refrain, to delay satisfaction, I want you to put that term in your, in your mind, delaying satisfaction, to know that I am going to, inshallah, in just a few hours, I'll be able to break my fast. And I'm going to be so much happier with that glass of water that I'm going to drink, with the dates or with the dinner that I'm going to have. I'm going to be so much happier with that. I'm going to enjoy that so much more than anybody else that's eating around me right now. Because everybody around me right now, they're just eating just because it's lunchtime. That's why they're eating. They might not even be hungry. It's just lunchtime. So we're going to eat. But I'm actually going to enjoy that. Our Prophet وسلم, said, The person who fasts has two times of enjoyment, great enjoyment. Farhatun in the fitrihi, he's going to enjoy it when he breaks his fast, right? Well, farhatun in the liqa'i rabbi, and he's going to be happy when he meets his Lord. Why? Because that fasting that prevented you in this life from eating and from drinking and from enjoying that certain parts of your day, that fasting will come and intercede on your behalf with the loss of hell time. And so you'll be happy that you fast. So practically, what you want to do in the month of Ramadan is make sure that you eat sahur every day. The Prophet said to Saharu, eat the pre-dawn meal, eat the sahur. For in the sahuri barakah, because there is blessing that is in that sahur. So having that bowl of cereal in the morning and some fruit, whatever it is that you do, whatever your routine is in your house, Allah will bless that for you and will allow it to carry you through the day all the way to the night. The one who created you, he knows you better than anybody else. He knows that that meal is all we need to be able to get through the day, alhamdulillah. And then you will enjoy it. And then come to the masjid. Break the fast, break your fast with the believers. Experience the, the beauty and the spirit of Ramadan. That, that's some quick advice uh, based on the time that we have. And I hope that at another point, inshallah, that we can get together and just talk to the youth about some of the things uh, related to Ramadan. That being said, the last point that I mentioned here before we stop is that for the parents, stop treating your 12 and 13 and 14 year old children like little kids. They are accountable at the age of puberty. The pen is not lifted anymore. It's writing down. The things that they do once they hit the, yes, okay, they, their brains are not fully matured yet. We understand all of that, but they are mukallaf, right? They are responsible in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the actions that they do. So don't baby them. Don't baby your kids at that age and you make them feel about Ramadan that it's something optional. Oh, you have football practice, baby. Don't worry about it. It's, huh? It's okay because you're going to get too thirsty. And we need you. Huh? We need you to go to football practice because we need you to make it to the NFL so we can get out the hood. Uh, this is the deen of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's nothing more precious to us than Allah. There's nothing more precious than practicing this deen. So make sure as parents that you begin to uh, teach your children the, the responsibility that they have to their creator from a very early age. It is a, I'm not going to say it's a crime, but it's unfortunate that a person would wait until their child hits the age of puberty to actually get them to start fasting. At the age of seven, start to get them used to the concept of fasting. Maybe they wake up at Sahur with you and they fast until they can't do it anymore at Dhuhr time. Or maybe from Dhuhr time, 
they hold back. They, they're not going to eat anything until you guys break fast at Maghrib. And they get used to the concept of fasting over time. By the time they hit the age of puberty, mashallah, they'll be experts. Okay, two more questions, inshallah. You can stand up if you want and look. You can look forward right at you. Which one? Oh, you have a question? How do we make dua? Okay, you want to say hello? You got to say hello. How do we make dua? Okay, mashallah. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we make dua. Dua, the, the best way to make dua if you're not in salah, right? If you're not in the prayer already, is to face the qibla. Okay, so face the direction of prayer. You put your hands together like this, and you face them up as if you're wanting something to come into your hands, like you're trying to catch something, right? And, and you ask Allah for whatever it is that you want from your heart. The best du'as, the best prayers, the best du'as are the du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And nobody called upon Allah better than the way that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called upon Allah. And he used to teach his prophet, he used to teach his companions certain du'as. So he taught Adi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to say, Allahumma hdini wa siddidni. Oh Allah, guide me and grant me success. Right? Really comprehensive dua. From the duas that the Prophet Sallallahu would make the most. Allahumma ya muqalib al qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, turner of the hearts, make my heart firm on your deen. And, and so many other prophetic duas. So all of these are are the du'as that the Prophet ﷺ would make, but how we make du'a, you make it from your heart. That's the most important thing that you are, you know what you're asking for, that you're in it. Your heart is in that du'a, you face the qibla, and you raise your hands. Otherwise, if you're in the prayer, the best place to make du'a in the prayer is when you are in sujood, when you are prostrate. Right. One more question? One more and we're done, because we, we got to pray, inshallah. <laughs> Oh, we got to call the event. Yes. Yes. Uh, we're going to call the Iqamah at 1230, inshallah. No matter when the event is called, the Iqamah is going to be at 1.30. 1.30, not 1230. I've got the clocks going up. No. Okay. Alhamdulillah. هذا والله أعلم صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شر لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وأتوب إليك. And I forgot at the very beginning to thank the Free Library of Philadelphia uh, for being here with us today for broadcasting this and recording this. But that was a slip from me. I meant to thank them after thanking Allah سبحانه وتعالى and obviously the Philadelphia Masjid for hosting us and Dr. Leo Schultz for being the coordinator of this and putting this together, alhamdulillah. So forgive me for delaying that thanks, but alhamdulillah, they remember. And jazakumullah khairan jami'an. Uh, before the adhan is called, uh, there's a brother named Sharif Brady. Is he here? Brother Sharif wants to, huh? No, no, I want you to do this, okay. okay. Brother Sharif, you're gonna sit here, inshallah. Brother Sharif is going to accept Islam, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, and Imam Leo, inshallah, will, do the honors. <laughs> you heard the whole lecture from the Sheikh. Yes. He went over the five pillars of Islam that you testify that there's none worthy of worship except Allah and that you testify that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger and that you are now afterwards, you make salah, prayer, and you'll learn. And then after that, you'll be responsible for zakah or giving charity. And then after that, you'll be responsible for Ramadan. And the whole lecture was about the month of Ramadan that's coming. 
in which the Muslims will fast. And after you become Muslim, you'll be responsible for Hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. If you are able to make this pilgrimage, you'll be responsible for at least the knowledge of it and knowing, learning about it. So you still want to become a Muslim, right? Yes. So repeat after me in Arabic. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadar. Muhammadar. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Now say it in English. You said, I bear witness. I bear witness. That there is no God but Allah. There is, but there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. And you are a Muslim. So, so now, so now you, so now you are our brother. Rarely all of the believers are brothers. So the Prophet Sallallahu he would tell those who be, became Muslim, he would let them know that their sins are forgiven. So whatever you did prior to this moment, Allah has forgiven you for it. So you're like a new baby, like one of these new babies in here that we heard, you know? And that you are you are clean and sinless. So we ask you to make dua for us. And the young sister just asked the Sheikh, how do you make dua? And he said, you face the Qibla, you know, you put your hands together, you raise it, and you come from your heart. And you ask Allah to forgive us to allow us to see Ramadan, to allow us to reap the benefit of Ramadan, to allow us to reap into these gates that he offers us during Ramadan and to make us unlawful for the hellfire. I mean, so we also ask you when you go home to make a, take a shower, right? You're gonna make wudu, right? And then tell them real fast, when you go home, you take shower, full, full shower, clean yourself, Start from the right side and the left side. Clean your hair, clean everything, because you're like new, inshallah. Um, alhamdulillah, you're a Muslim. Yeah, Sheikh is going to take you to learn how to make wudu, and the Sheikh is going to get ready to call the adhan. So I just want to conclude this program as well with the reminder that if you want more information about this path of Islam of lecture series, or if you would like to see this this uh in repeat you can find it on the freelibrary.org forward slash path of islam or you can email directly at mmw at freelibrary.org thank everybody for coming up